It's clear when it comes to the news, people have trust issues. In popular culture, journalists and reporters are often celebrated as heroes who are uncovering corruption, war crimes, and other forms of injustice. We gotta nail these scumbags! We gotta show people that nobody can get away with this! But in reality, public trust in media has dropped to a new low. In the 1970s, research by Gallup found that 72% of Americans trusted the news. Now, in recent years, this has dropped to around 40%, with a historic low in 2016 of 32%. But where does this idea that we should trust the news even come from? What do we expect from reporters and journalists? Last episode, we took a look at the polarization of the news. Now, most people seem to be aware of the political and commercial interest in media. In the same Gallup study, 8 out of 10 Americans see a fair or a great deal of bias in news coverage. So why do we expect objectivity anyway? I went to the source itself and spoke to journalists about their role in the media landscape. The media tends to play judge a lot, and I have a problem with that. That's not our job. Instead of making judgments, we let others do that, and we cover stories from as many perspectives as possible. I would define my purpose as a photojournalist just to kind of relay and inform and convey a scene to someone, not necessarily, I'm not coming at from a perspective of trying to change something. I think that's more activism. Why did it happen? That's the job of a reporter. As a reporter, you're taking it from different directions and you want to balance it out. That's where my skill as a reporter comes in, to get as much as many facts as I can at that time because I need to tell my viewers what's going on. They're itching for the story. Because everyone tells the story from their own angle. It is your job to have a combination of angles and perspectives and find a balance and narrow it down for your viewers. So there seems to be a consensus that the job of a journalist is to listen and hear from as many perspectives as possible and flesh out a story and broadcast it to a wider audience. They do the research and present their findings back to us, the news consumer. Think of the idea of the foreign correspondent. Since we cannot possibly be everywhere at the same time, we rely on them to talk to people on the ground and report the story back to us. And our job is to tell these various stories and the nuances within those stories. Of course, we need to understand the impact of what that story will be. The most exciting part for me is actually going the field and reporting and talking to people because that is when you connect with the people and when you connect with the people and when you connect with the voices in your story, that's when you stay in touch with the world. I feel alive. So any kind of sort of logical reason or for me to have like sort of moral, you know, moral purpose to it, yeah, of course that's there. But the really selfish reason is that I just love it. And that's why I do what I do. Hi, my name is Fariba Nawa. I'm the host of OnSpec and a freelance journalist. When I was 12 years old, that's when I knew I wanted to be a journalist. And it was a way to express myself and learn to empathize. My first foreign assignment was Pakistan. Islam of Pakistan and Peshawar. And then I went inside my homeland, Afghanistan. I choose my stories based on my own interest. And that's the beauty of being a freelancer. Mostly in Turkey, I've focused on migration and women's rights. Those are the two subjects that I've sort of honed in on besides the breaking news that goes on here, which we know is a lot. when I was in America. I was encouraged to develop my own voice. And I'm like, as a journalist, I'm not supposed to have a voice. I'm just supposed to tell you the facts. And I was confused. I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> is this journalism? The point of journalism is the truth. It's to give people accurate information about how things are. The point of journalism isn't to make everything better. And I think journalists really confuse those two things. Advocates are what we need for improvement, but not journalists. You're in business as a journalist to sort of explain and tell people what's in between the line. And you see, it's a blurred line between your opinion and actually telling facts. What changed over time is that it became in the interest of the newspapers particularly to appeal to a larger audience. That means you didn't want just the left or the right, you wanted both. And so that created a tradition, uh, along with a few other things, where there was an attempt to give just the facts, a kind of middle of the road perspective. The idea of objective journalism again has to do with the fact that news is made to make money. 
And so in the last century, it was a newspaper's interest to be nonpartisan, objective, neutral, to attract as many advertisers as possible. And that built an ethic in journalism that newsrooms still cling on to. Over the last 50 years, journalists have really tried, at least, to be objective. And that was a way of saying journalism is something special and valuable and something that can be trusted. In the past, I think, there was always a sense that the journalist was supposed to be anonymous. They were in disembodied voice. They are almost trying to be scientific. They were saying, here is what is happening in the world. I'm just reflecting uh, what is real and what is true. There's a group of more traditionally schooled journalists who believe that journalists should be nothing but an impartial observer. Their voice and their beliefs have no place in their reporting. But in recent years, more and more journalists have questioned this idea of impartiality and objectivity. Can anyone really be objective? Do you think it's possible to have fully objective There's no such thing as objectivity that, that I've learned throughout the years. No journalist can be totally objective, totally unbiased on every story. That the test of a journalist of integrity is over a, a reasonable length of time, how hard does he or she try to keep their own biases out? There's a lot of old school thinkers, especially white men, coming from powerful countries who say, well, no, no, we have our voice cannot be in it. We're not relevant. Okay, so you as a white man may not be relevant, but me as a refugee child from Afghanistan, who had to flee my country at the age of nine, whose school was bombed, and you know, who I, who I saw my classmate die in front of me. I am relevant and I am gonna talk about my perspective and I am gonna put myself in the story because it matters. Also, people connect more. Questioning objectivity does not mean that journalists should just embrace objectivity and write opinion pieces all day. Instead, it means to be as fair and accurate as possible and using our awareness of our personal biases to be even more thorough in our reporting. And I think our job as a journalist has never been more important because you want to sift through that noise and distill the truth. And because also disinformation is so high, that's why investigative journalism skill is very highly priced now because the truth is just hitting all wraps of crap these days. You have to look through it and sift through it and find what the truth is. My name is Ade Shewa Josh. I'm a broadcast journalist. I've been doing this job for nearly a decade. I currently am in Istanbul, Turkey. My career has been defined by one major story, which is uh, covering Boko Haram. Survivors of the attack in Bama will never forget how more than 300 of their loved ones were slaughtered on this bridge for refusing to join Boko Haram. Telling other people's stories and highlighting stories of injustice, social development, um, politics and stuff sort of came naturally to me. We had the luxury of driving this route, but for many refugees, they had to make the journey on foot. I have covered migration, terrorism, the impact of terror on communities. I've also covered refugee stories. So I went from a television presenter just highlighting uh, superstars and celebrities in the entertainment industry to wanting to do something, if you like, more meaningful with myself. American journalist Tom Rosensteel reminds us that originally, objectivity was more about the process than the journalist itself. To Rosensteel, journalistic objectivity was never intended to mean balance or neutrality. Instead, it meant something like the pursuit of truth using objective methods, because journalism is conducted by human beings and therefore can never be truly objective. Their methods have to be instead. This farce of objectivity is almost dishonest. It's dishonest, and the readers and the listeners and the viewers, they see that. Rosa Steele's comments were in response to journalist Wesley Lowry, who in a New York Times essay argued that newsrooms were facing a long due reckoning over the meaning of objectivity. So what does that mean in practice? I think Wesley Lowry gives a pretty good idea of how to acknowledge our subjectivity while engaging in a process of objectivity. He encourages journalists to take a pledge to devote ourselves to accuracy, that we will diligently seek out the perspectives of those with whom we personally may be inclined to disagree, and that we will be just as sure to ask hard questions of those with whom we're inclined to agree. If then, not the journalist but the process itself is meant to be objective, things become more complicated when we realize even the process itself is flawed. The objective journalism model works off of what we understand to be news value. 
values. And those news values in and of itself bias the journals, right? When we think about news value, we think about things like timeliness, unusualness, uh, the impact, right? Like, all of those things bias us towards some stories and some framings of stories and away from other stories. Sometimes the most important thing in the country isn't the thing that happened in the last hour. It was the thing that happened yesterday. But when you turn on the news, what will you be watching? The thing that happened in the last hour. We also know that neutral, objective journalism is constructed atop a pyramid of subjective decision-making. Which stories to cover, how intensely to cover those stories, which sources to seek out and include, which pieces of information are highlighted and which are downplayed. No journalistic process is objective, and no individual journalist is objective because no human being is. Everybody has a bias, and so I think what we can do is be fair and be honest about that bias. So when I cover stories, I'm very transparent about who I am because I think people have a right to know. In some ways, people trust authenticity. They like to see uh, material that comes directly from the public themselves. That's why they connect more with personal essays. That's why they connect more with these voices on the ground rather than sort of this voiceless reporter behind the scenes. And you can do that. Of course you can do that. Uh, you can take yourself out of the story. If you aren't relevant, you actually should take yourself out of the story, but still tell me who you are. To me, that's important when I'm reading something. When I'm the consumer of news, I want to know, you know, who's John Smith. And so again, the system of objectivity was not about creating objective journalists. Rather, it was about creating an objective journalistic process. Over the course of the objectivity model in American journalism, what we've seen is a shift where that standard is no longer being applied to the model, but rather is being applied to the journalist. And so you have a lot of performative objectivity, journalists who do not vote and declare publicly that they do not vote, as if they can now somehow become objective if they abstain from political engagement. I think that one of the biggest problems with objectivity is that it has become understood as a devotion to false balance, which leads us to a different concept, neutrality. The word objectivity has, has suddenly gained all of these additional words that are not really synonyms. So sometimes we talk about objectivity, but we also talk about balance. Where balance and objectivity are not the same thing. We talk about neutrality. You're writing a piece about climate change and you go out of your way to find a climate denialist scientist so that no one can argue that you did not have that voice included, even if there's no factual basis to include such a person. The idea that journalists should be free of any opinion is easy to defend when your opinion fits the status quo. Journalism is not a he said, she said story. It goes beyond just reporting two opposite sides. Truthful, not neutral. There's a difference. Yes. Truthful is bringing the truth. Neutral can be creating a false equivalence. We should cover them truthfully. We should cover them fairly. Uh, but I still think we should be questioning kind of the meaning of neutrality in this time. Consider the story of Lewis Wallace. In 2017, Lewis Wallace was fired from his job at Marketplace when he wrote a personal medium blog stating that objectivity is dead. As a journalist who is transgender and the only trans journalist at the company, he questioned the idea of both objectivity and neutrality. He writes that journalists can both come from a particular perspective and still tell the truth. We can check our facts, tell the truth and hold the line without pretending that there is no ethical basis to the work that we do. An important sort of shift for us right now is to, to move away from this conflation of um, objectivity or nonpartisanship or being non-biased with being trustworthy um, because they are not inherently the same and I think those concepts have become really muddled in a way that's actually really damaging. There's really no good reason to hold on to neutrality as a core value in journalism. In his blog, Lewis Wallace explains his issue with neutrality is that neutrality is impossible for me, and you should admit that it is for you too. As a member of a marginalized community, I have never had the opportunity to pretend I can be neutral. Now, the idea of neutrality seems almost counterintuitive. Maybe not in all forms of journalism, but at least in investigative journalism, which is meant to uncover information that is otherwise inaccessible to the public. Sometimes that is as simple as going through a bureaucratic process, but at times it can be unsafe or even dangerous. Take the example of Daphne Caruana Galizia, a journalist from Malta who was assassinated after reporting on money laundering, corruption and nepotism. Or Jamal Khashoggi, 
a Washington Post columnist who was murdered inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. And that's only a number of dozens of journalists who are killed each year. Reporters Without Borders says that 80 journalists have been killed so far this year. Now that's 15 more than last year, and it makes 2018 the most lethal on record. So this whole idea that journalists can and should not be political just crumbles apart, especially when you consider places where press freedom and access to information are under attack. When journalists are facing censorship, imprisonment and arrest, reporting the truth becomes a political act in itself. Jason Rezaian is spending his 447th night in a jail in Iran tonight. The main threat against journalists in Nigeria today is a government that is intolerant to freedom of expression. The police raided my office on charges of conspiracy to topple the government. On a mis des explosifs sous le siège de ma voiture. J'ai été amputé de mon bras gauche et de ma jambe gauche. I got attacked and my equipment got smashed up. I got tortured that night. But the example does not have to be that extreme. Take the case of Jorge Ramos, who was kicked out of an Iowa press event after he confronted Trump about his immigration policies. This is how he reflects on neutrality and taking a stance after the event. Yo debía de dejar de ser neutral en ese momento. A partir de entonces cambió mi misión como periodista. Iba a enfrentar al candidato y demostrar que estaba equivocado, que no era cierto lo que él decía de los inmigrantes en los Estados Unidos. A lot of people seem to have an issue when journalism meets activism, but I think there are times when you just can't expect a journalist not to take a stance. Eli Wiesel, el sobreviviente del holocausto, premio Nobel de la Paz, y a quien perdimos desafortunadamente hace muy poco, decía unas palabras muy sabias. Decía, debemos tomar partido. La neutralidad solo ayuda al opresor, nunca a la víctima. Y tiene toda la razón. Los periodistas estamos obligados a tomar partido en ciertas circunstancias in cases of racism, discrimination, corruption, mentiras públicas, dictaduras and derechos humanos, we have to leave aside lado la neutrality and the indifference. I straddled the line because in journalism school, again, or in journalism, you learn that you have to keep a distance because that's the healthiest thing to do. You can't save people. You, it's not your job. In fact, you can harm them more if you think that way. And so a lot of my stories about girls and women have involved this dilemma for me is how far do I go in trying to help them? So when I'm done with the story, then as a human being, I try to help them. Um, and that's important to me because it doesn't stop with the story. Young boy is hit in the head. That's him there on the ground, captured on my DV camera. If he stays there, he might get killed. So I pick him up. I carry him to the barricade. You perhaps become something different from a traditional objective journalist, and that kind of breaks the spell. And it can create problems for the audience as well. Are you a journalist or are you a rescuer? Are you part of this story or are you just telling it? Camera in my hand and I started to run toward him to take video of it. I and mean, that was my first instinct. And I took, I mean, two steps running toward him and then I thought it just seemed, in a split second, it just seemed inappropriate. And then there was criticism about it that I'd crossed a line, that I had, you know, gotten involved in, in something that I shouldn't have. I'd do it again, you know. I think there's definitely space for activism and subjectivity in journalism. But then you're kind of crossing maybe some traditional ethical lines as to what journalism is. I don't have a savior complex, but why shouldn't I have a job that has an impact? It makes a difference. And when I see that, of course, it feels good. It feels good. And I appreciate that. I think there's still an impact. I mean, photography is not ever going, I think, in my opinion, to change the world or stop a war or save humanity from some sort of oblivion. Photographs still, especially with like Alan Kurdi, this photograph of a dead Syrian child on a beach in Turkey, did change, for example, European policy. So I think photos still have power in that sense. <laughs> And then those kind of blurred lines between activism, citizen journalism, and more traditional journalism. I think one of the reasons why we've seen a lot of debate about objectivity, neutrality, and activism is because we've seen a rise in citizen journalism. With general access to smartphones and social media, people have challenged the professional practice of mainstream media. Yeah, everybody pretty much has access to a camera or a phone. 
doesn't make everybody a professional photographer or videographer or journalist, but it is part of the puzzle of journalism to make up those pieces and fill in the gaps where maybe professionally trained or professionally working journalists of all mediums don't have access. You know, a citizen journalist is that person who's out walking their dog, minding their own business when a plane crashes and they film it. You know, at any point, anyone today can become the most important journalist in the world. So to me, anyone who holds up a camera and tells us what's going on is not a reporter. It's user-generated content, and God bless it. But reporters have a much more uh, deeper, stronger obligation to incorporate all the views, to balance it out, and to explain to us what is going on there in a way that, okay, you get both sides of the story. That's why we do this job, not to take one person's idea and just smash it across our faces and see if that's everything that happened. The average citizen is not going to investigate a corrupt multinational corporation or corrupt politicians. That's going to be a journalist with sources who digs deep and, and finds those stories. In general, yeah, of course, citizen journalism is a great thing, but I think it's just formal media institutions need to be careful in the way they use citizen journalism, I think. It may not be completely uh, objective. It, people maybe not, they don't have the traditional journalism training and ethics and Right now, the, the key thing that these companies need to be doing and what a lot of them are doing is making news from noise. Uh, you know, we're seeing all of these different puzzle pieces drop off these photos, these tweets. Journalists have to sit there and find that narrative and figure out what happened. You know, we can see all these pieces, they come together, and there's your story. Before, if you were talking about police brutality or these riots, you would have to perceive it in the way it was framed and presented to you. Nicholas Sandman is another example. You would have to perceive in the way that it's edited and presented to you by the corporate press. Now everyone is a video, has a video camera. Everyone has their perspective. And it's very useful when these incidents happen, where you could see the same incident from several angles and you don't need Don Lemon or Chris Wallace to tell me what this means. I can see with my own eyes. Truth is unobstructed on social media. Like if you're, if you're careful, and patient, you can see the truth. Yeah. Like for example, data on COVID, some of the best sources are doctors. Like if you want to know the truth about the coronavirus, what's happening is uh, there's follow people on Twitter. Yeah. There's certain people that are yeah. just like source of information versus the CDC and the WHO. Right. I mean, I think, I think technology has disrupted everything in terms of how news works, which is to inform. But informing is no longer the main objective of news. Analysis is there. People want to understand what's going on around them. It's why you have people covering beats. Now, obviously, journalism is not just one thing. There are broadcast journalists, investigative citizen, photo, even Twitter journalists these days. The meaning of journalism is changing when communication and technology changes and honestly has become completely inflated. Just take a look at how John Oliver reacts when he's called a journalist and what he thinks that says about the media landscape today. I, I really appreciate the fact that <laughs> you're right. I'm not a respected uh, journalist because uh, I'm not a journalist. Are you a journalist? No, no, you, I'm not. So, no, I'm a comedian. But you're doing the job of a journalist. No, I'm doing the job of a comedian. So my, I make jokes about the news. So I'm, I'm pretty clear about the lane that I'm in. But, but let me just say that you have more credibility than most journalists here in the United States, and I would say in many other countries. But that is more of an insult to the current state of journalism than it is a compliment to the state of it comedy. It is, it is, I, I agree. I'm not sure where I myself stand on objectivity and whether it can be achieved as a journalistic process. But what I now do understand is that the meaning of objectivity and neutrality are driven by a media landscape that has an allegiance to power and aims to be palatable to advertisers. In the next episode, I will take a closer look at these commercial interests in media and how tech giants like Google, Facebook, and Twitter are only eroding the news industry further. Thank you for watching. Please hit like if you enjoyed this video and don't forget to subscribe for more content. You might also like our after show where we talk a little bit more about these topics. <laughs>